Hi, and welcome to Smelling Coffee TV, a ministry of First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Mississippi. I'm Jennifer Walker, your host, and this is also a ministry of uh, my blog, smellingcoffee.com. And so this, is, this TV show is the blog live. And so I'm so glad you've joined us today. And I have a very special guest with me today. This is Megan Cunningham. And you are gonna get to meet her and hear her fabulous story. And before I introduce you to Megan and let her start sharing with you, um, we always open our segments each time with a cup, a coffee mug. And I'm actually making some coffee right now for us to drink that we're about to share. But I want you to see this very unique coffee mug. I bought this mug this way. The designer, the potter, made this mug this way. And I've been saving it for an episode. I've been saving it for over two years, just waiting for just the right time to bring it to you. I drink out of it often. But if you can see this coffee mug, it's, it's dented, it's smushed. It's not exactly what you would call um, perfect as far as it being compared with the shape of this mug. Do you see the difference? But the designer of this mug did it on purpose. And I was talking with him. I got this at an arts and crafts fair that we have here in Cleveland every year. And um, I was talking with him about this mug and, and I said, was this an accident? And he said, no, this was on purpose. And I said, well, how did you make this? And he said he started off by making a perfect mug, what he would consider a perfect mug, perfectly shaped. And as it was on the wheel, he then smushed it. And then he dented it and he squeezed it and he kept making it flatter until he got it misshapen exactly the way that he wanted it. And he said, if you'll notice, the places that I smashed it are ergonomically correct so that when you are drinking out of it, your fingers have a perfect spot to go. And it's really a very comfortable mug to drink out of. And so I could not resist buying this mug and I will grab it many days when I feel kind of imperfect myself, when I feel like um, things aren't going so well for me or I feel like I might be a little bit um, disappointing to the Lord myself or disappointed in myself. And I think back to this and I think the designer made this perfectly imperfect. And when I am focusing on my own flaws and imperfections, I look at this mug and I think, no, God has designed me exactly the way he chose for his great glory. And the places that I'm dented in are the places that are exactly the places that they need to be because God has a purpose for them. Maybe not for me, but for someone else that they may be able to grab hold of and God can use for his great glory. He uses my weaknesses for his glory. And so today, Megan is gonna be telling her story of how God has given her a beautiful family with some imperfect perfectness and how God has used that for his glory. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. And I'm so glad you're here. And Megan and I were talking on um, Sunday and uh, she was just telling me about her, her child and we were talking about him. And uh, I said, would you please come on the show and tell me about it and tell me your story? Because she just kept saying over and over and over that she was the luckiest mom in the world. And that has that that made me cry that made me i did i stood there and cried and i said you've got to come share this story so megan tell us about um about you let um i wrote down some things that i know about you you are a busy military wife a mom of four a teacher a daughter a sister a friend and um so you tell us about your family well um i think to start off it's it's important to say that we are extremely close. Um, we have, we do, my husband is a pilot in the Air Force. He, and um, so he travels in and out a lot. So we are pretty busy. Um, we have four beautiful babies. Very beautiful if you ask me. <laughs> um, Colton is 14, he'll be 15, April 15th. And then Allie Kyle will, she's eight, she'll be nine in June. John Randall is six. And Alden Kate just turned one. And so, um, and around here we have, we pretty much travel as a pack, kind of like I told you. Um, my parents, my sister, all of us, um, my husband's family, we're all very close. And so we are very, very blessed by a huge support system that um, knows us and loves us in all our chaos. 
So um, that's pretty much our family. <laughs> All right. So uh, tell us about your first child. Okay, Colton. Um, he is. Oh goodness, how do you even start? Um, when Colton and Brett was born, what I like to tell people is what's crazy, when he was born, um, when, you're, when you're a newborn, the nurses do an initial test and it's called the APGAR. Um, and so when Colton was born, his APGAR was actually, um, his score was better than any of his other three siblings. So we had no, um, no idea, you know, we had ran the genetic testing, Nothing came flagged, nothing was even odd. And um, wonderful, wonderful hospital experience, nothing there. Um, and so when he, <coughs> excuse me, when he got to around six months, we started noticing that the developmental milestones were falling and they were lacking. And But you know, I was a new mother, I was very young. And so I, I, I could accredit it to things like, um, well, you know, he's not exposed that much and he's not, and we're just not working with him enough. So I, and what's really crazy is um, a lot of people think I went into special education because of him, and that's not true. I was a special education major from the time I started at Delta State. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, like I told you, God's plan was rolling long before I thought it. Um, so even as I was sitting in these classes, you know, learning the developmental milestones and learning these things that he should be hitting, and he wasn't coming close, it was like the denial was so serious that I couldn't, I couldn't grasp it. And, you know, everybody would say, well, how's Colton? And I would say, oh, he's perfect, you know. Um, and so it got to a point where I couldn't deny it anymore. So we went to Jackson and they diagnosed him with, which was called um, ONH. And that's um, optic nerve hypoplasia. So that was his first diagnosis. Well, in my mind, I could say that he wasn't doing these things because he couldn't see. So I thought just because one optic nerve was better, it was contributing to everything. And that was okay. You know, I was able to deal with that and um, and I was able to accept it. So, um, and the, but the more it went on, the more it, he started having seizures. And it um, that's not something I could ever explain to anybody that's never been through it with their child. Um, I always told everybody if there's one thing I could take away, it would be that because that's the most helpless you'll ever feel in your life. And um, so when that started, I knew in my heart that I couldn't deny it anymore. And so we, um, we ended up, my mom and I went to a conference at Le Bonheur because we were just trying to, you know, we were going to anything we could to try and help us. And while we were there, a lady spoke and um, she, everything she said matched up perfectly. And my mom and I had no reason to go that day. We just decided we woke up that morning. I said, let's just go. Let's just go see what we can get. Um, it turned out that she was you know, through everything, she was a specialist in his particular form of cerebral palsy. Wow. Like it was, it but was just crazy. No, no, no. Palsy. but everything she said, you know, I would, I would write it down and I'd look at my mom and I'd write it down and I'd look at her. And it was like, so I went up afterwards and I talked to her and it turned, you know, she wasn't, she was pretty packed on patients, but um, she ended up accepting us. And so we went the next month to New Orleans to the Children's Hospital and she sat with me and we went through brain scan after brain scan and she you know nobody had ever done that with us and so she sat down you know she specified the quadrant of his brain that was everything you know and that's when we decided to do the genetic testing um, because Kyle and I knew that we wanted more children but we didn't you know there was never a reason um, so we did do the genetic testing and um, I can't remember now, it's all a big, but we did the genetic testing and two days later, Hurricane Katrina hit. Well, our hospital is in New Orleans and right on the river. And so um, the entire bottom floor was wiped out and that's where all our, all of our um, blood work and everything was. And um, it was supposed to be sent to Detroit. Well, it never made it. And about two weeks later, we found out that um, we were, that Ali Kyle was coming and so we just decided from that point on we would not do any genetic testing that we were it was god's will for our family and there was no questioning it so and then three more came along and while they're perfect <laughs> in the society's eyes we we wonder about them sometimes <laughs> <laughs> oh well um what would be 
Okay, so so he was how old when he was diagnosed? He was all, he was one and a half, almost two when he was diagnosed. When point. we got the cerebral palsy diagnosis. Okay. okay, so and then you were having another baby. Yes. So. But even then, it was. Um, I tell people it's like. This, I'm gonna pour some coffee. Okay, that sounds coffee. good. It's like the stages of grief. You know, mm -hmm. you go through, you see about the stages of grief, and you you read about it, and you you think it's a completely different because although we didn't lose, I didn't lose him and it's so selfish to think that way, but it was like I lost every dream that I'd ever had for him. I, I wanted you to share that because uh, on Facebook the other day, you were talking about him becoming 15. Yes. And I, would you because, share, um, share what you were saying on Facebook? You know, he's becoming 15 and, and we're around a lot of parents. Um, that have kids his age because you know they started school together and we they know him and they love him just like we do and I think a lot of times people take for granted which I did too you know I hate to I hate to say that I didn't take these things for granted you know I didn't they, I took everything for granted well, before sure, him sure but you know I hear him saying oh we're going to get our permit or we're headed to do this and you know and it's they're not saying that it's a burden, but it is, and it's a worry, but I think they don't realize just how much, I mean, I would give everything I had to be taking him to get his permit. I would get it, give everything I have for him to be smart mouthed to me, you know, and it's, yeah. I just, I don't think, I wish you could put into words for them to understand, like, even the bad times, don't take them for granted, because I would, you know, I would give anything to argue with him. I would give anything to worry about him driving. I would give anything to watch him play baseball, football, soccer, golf, anything. Um, but that's just not our reality. And mm -hmm. and I. What is your reality? Tell us what our reality, reality is. Looks like. Is very small victories. I mean, every little. And I think, you know, I look back on when God gave him to us, and I think I was at a point where. I didn't appreciate, you know, you don't, you appreciate the big things like, oh, you know, I, I got a scholarship to go to school. I got this and that. And those are the big things. I got a new car. Well, those things don't matter. I mean, I learned quickly that him raising his arm to reach a toy that was, you know, two feet above his head was so much more of a victory than, mm. you know, anything else. And you learn that everything you thought was once so important and you know the big things and they're just not and I think God used him I mean he didn't just use him he taught me more in a year with him than I had learned in 19 years and it was kind of like I felt like at that point I had I had gotten to a point where I had fallen I mean I had fallen like I was I was not than me I used to be and I was not appreciative and I was I was just you know you were just getting away little mm -hmm. by little and even no matter how hard my parents tried it was like I pushed back and I pushed back and I pushed back and then he was born and it was kind of like you know at that point when you feel so alone because even though I was surrounded by mm -hmm. hundreds of people that loved me and supported me um, none of them understood what it was like you know, you can't understand the blame and the, I still, I mean, still to this day, I feel guilt because, you know, even though it's, we can't prove anything that happened, we can't, we've tried, but it's just not worth it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it is. And even though I've come to a point of acceptance where I, I mean, I, I couldn't be more thankful that he's ours and everything that he teaches us in the same sense, there are still days where, and it's little stuff like, you know, my younger kids are involved in a lot, and so we'll be out at the ballpark and see somebody that I know that he started school with. And, you know, you see him out there, and you see all his friends that he started school with, and they're out there, and you're just crushed again. I mean, so it's... It's, it's a daily diet. It is. It, of self and of... Right. Maybe of grief with, of what would Could have, have been. been. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And And, you know, I think, you know, I prayed about it for a long time because I felt like... I was going against God not accepting it. Like, okay, you just need to accept this. But
But then I realized, you know, the more, the more I read and the more I prayed on it, that God didn't expect me to accept it. You know, he knows that forever I'm going to wish I had just, and not because I, I wouldn't change him in any way now, right. but he's, he knows, he knew my, he knew this would be a struggle. exactly. Yes. And he, but he knew it was a struggle that as a family we could conquer. I mean, it's, you know, it's, well, he designed he did um, perfectly imperfect right. for your family right. on purpose. And he and is set him in the midst of your family because he knew that your family would use him and and, and love him and God would use your whole family for right. his glory. And I and, and you, you know all I have don't done that, Megan. I don't know. I mean I feel you know, I and that was over this past year after his surgery. You know, I told somebody, I said there were so many nights, um, because I don't guess I've really told about the surgery, but um, it was a year ago, March 7th, that he had bilateral hip and pelvis reconstruction. And um, when a normal child has a, has a surgery, you know, you say, you're fine, here's some medicine, um, it's gonna be okay. Well, I could say that and he didn't understand. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't see in his eyes that he understood. And I knew that, he knew that I was his protector and he knew that I would not hurt him. And, and I just caused, I mean, pain that I can't even imagine to him. And so it would go night after night and he would just cry for 24, 48, 72 hours. And, you know, at that point, I can remember so many nights just falling on my knees and just beg. I was like, God, please tell me what you want us to do. Please, you know, tell me something. Like, you know, and it's like I was looking for him to look down and say, give him the... So and so, you know, but but at that point he was all I had because I I mean I was just to that point where I mean nobody understood. We couldn't let anybody in our house because he was scared when the door opened and he would he would panic and it would I mean he was you know, you you realize when you get to a point where I mean I was giving him Valium and everything else to try and calm his nerves and calm his and it was just and it was like I tell my husband it was like a you know, one night, I always said when Alden Kate was born, like with each of the children, I always tried to find a verse that I would put in their room mm -hmm. that would kind of be, you know. And so when Alden Kate was born, for some reason, John 1, 16 is what we took, which is the, um, you know, out of the fullness of His grace, we have received one blessing after another. And so I told Kyle when she was born, I said, that's going to be our verse. Like, that's our family verse. That's her verse. And it was like, it hit me like, this is just a, a small trial, you know, in the overwhelming blessings. And I felt like at that point I was letting myself get so compounded with, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and I couldn't see it. And we were in her room and I was rocking him because she had a rocking chair and I looked up and I saw that and I was like, this is okay. Like, it's going to be fine. It's just another trial, but the blessings are coming, you know, and now a year, a year, a year later, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, a year later, I mean, we're back in therapy. We ordered a stander two days ago to try and get him standing again. Like, and that's something at that point I couldn't see. I couldn't see past, you know, the crying and the, the blind. I mean, cause it's like I went, I reverted right back to blaming myself, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't see what good could come of it. But then I look back and I've read through, you know, for a year I wouldn't look back and now I'm I've looked back and I've looked at the videos and the pictures and I've read through the posts and I can see now how it was all just a, you know, it was all just a building block because our family needed it. We needed it. Not that he needed the pain, but it was just a part of our trial. And it just, you know, in a year, I feel like I drew closer to him in that year than I have in 10 years since Colton mm -hmm. was born because it was kind of like we were just into the, you know, the everyday you know, and then it was like when he was all I had, it was, it was so, even when I had nobody, I had him and I could, you know. You mean Colton or the Lord? Which, the Lord. The Lord, okay. And, okay. But it was through Colton. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I want us to keep, keep rolling. Can we keep going? Yes. And we are about out of time on the, for this one show. So yes. we're going to make this into two shows. Okay. So if you will stay with us and look for us next week and look for the next show, um, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep uh, talking and keep taping, and we're gonna we'll have a part two of this because I still want Megan to share uh, some other things that she's learned overall. I want her to share a word of encouragement to parents 
who might be um, facing anything with their children, maybe not as severe as what uh, they have gone through, but as parents, we all con are concerned of our children. We all tend to compare, which is what she was doing, you know, in a big way, but we all look at other people's children and say, why can't my child be like that in some way? And so I want her to, we're gonna keep talking about that and I hope you will come back and join us next week on Smelling Coffee TV. I wanna leave us though with some encouragement today. In my quiet time, just this morning, let me find my phone, I hit it back here. Um, <laughs> I wanna share with you as we wrap it up what the Lord gave me this morning and it really goes with all of this. If you are discouraged over what God has allowed into your life that is perfectly imperfect and you wonder why God may have done that, it's not because he doesn't love you. God gave this family, Colton Brett, not because he doesn't love them, but because he has a greater purpose for them. And the trials that Megan was, was describing, there were probably many dark days that, that you went through, especially during this past year and this surgery. There was never a time that God did not see, that he was not watching over them with care, that he was not present. And this morning, my name of Jesus was um, the God who sees, and it comes from Genesis 16, 3, and it was about a parent. So this was about Hagar. This was about a mom who was concerned for the welfare of her own child. And Hagar had, had run away with her child because she didn't feel like there was any hope for him. And then an angel of the Lord came to her and spoke to her and gave, um, gave her some hope in the Lord and said that God saw and God heard. And she was able to say that she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are God who sees. And she said, for I have not even here in the wilderness remained alive, for have I not even here in the wilderness remained alive after seeing him who sees me with understanding and compassion. And so I, I wrote and I shared this on Facebook and on Instagram today that my name of God today is El Roy and that's the God who sees and that's from Genesis 16, 13. This is our God who never sleeps, who sees every detail, who is aware even when we feel like he has forgotten, who is the great omnipresent God and we, his people, the sheep of his hand are never out of his vision or out of his care, not for a single moment. This is our mighty God, our Abba Father. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He does not grow tired or weary, and nothing is too hard for him. And he is taking care of his trusting children both today and always. We can praise his holy name in that. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 scripture verses that, that all of these truths about the Lord came from that I list there. And so that is the God who is watching over you, who you have come to know in a more intimate way through this. That is the God who's watching over me. That is the God who's watching over you. So if you are at a time of discouragement and you need to be reminded that you are not alone and you are not forgotten, this is the God who is watching over you. He sees all and he is present and he loves you. And I hope and pray that you will take that and grasp on to him today. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you so much that you are the God who sees and you are the almighty, all present, all knowing God and the all loving God and that you are Abba, Father, and that you love us and that you are coming to our rescue and that, that while we are living in this falling apart world, you are the one sure hope that we can cling to. Lord, I pray encouragement for the people that are seeing this, and I, I just pray that you would help them to turn to you, to your word. You are our anchor to hold on to when the storms are raging. Thank you for walking with us hand in hand. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Hope you'll join us again on Smelling Coffee TV. You can find all these episodes on YouTube under Smelling Coffee TV, and you can join me on my blog at smellingcoffee.com and also on Facebook at Smelling Coffee Blog and TV. And uh, catch up with what's going on at First Baptist Cleveland at UndertheSeeple.com. And Megan will be back with us in the next episode. So look for it, okay? And we'll see you next time on Smelling Coffee TV, where we always seek the aroma of the knowledge of Jesus Christ in every place.